Hello, welcome to AT&T Threat Track for October 21st, 2014. This program provides network security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. Uh, today we're joined by Stan Nurlov, Manny Ortiz, and uh, Matt Kaiser. I'm Brian Rexrode, and uh, Stan, we've been having some conversations about the, uh, the Poodle vulnerability. Can you explain a little bit about what that is, and maybe we can do a little comparison contrast. <laughs> well, the Poodle, uh vulnerability is one that uh, was recently disclosed, I think last week. Um, it affects SSL as a protocol, uh, right. specifically SSL v3. It's a weakness in, uh, I guess, a, the padding that's used uh, in some of the modes of encryption that they have. Mm -hmm. And uh, an attacker who is able to do a man in the middle uh, is actually is going to be able to possibly guess uh, some of the plain text. Basically, is going to be able to, with some effort, get the contents of the communication, which is supposed to be encrypted by just being in the middle. It does require full man in the middle, so not passive. You actually have to be able to intercept the traffic and then send it onwards and make sure that the victim doesn't receive any of the replies from the server. So it, it, it takes some effort, uh, but the attack is against the SSL v3 protocol. Right. So I guess just to do a little compare, I mean, I think a lot of people have been kind of comparing this with the Heartbleed, perhaps because it's an open SSL in both cases. So Well, it, that's the thing. It's not exactly open SSL in both cases, whereas um, Heartbleed was specific to versions of open SSL, the implementation mm -hmm. of, of SSL. This is specific to SSL itself, mm -hmm. the protocol. Right. So there's a big difference in that. This is more of a mathematical attack against the encryption that happens within SSL v3. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's not quite as, in, in my opinion, it's not as big a deal because, as, as Stan was saying, it requires a full man in the middle. You have to be able to not only sit and watch both ends, but sort of tamper with them. Uh, mm -hmm. It takes about 256 tries to decode one single byte of right. encrypted data. This is a padding oracle attack, and the name kind of says something about that. It's padding Oracle on downgraded legacy encryption. Mm -hmm. uh, so in short, that's saying it's a padding Oracle attack on the old version of the uh, encryption protocol, SSLv3. So you mentioned, I think, a couple of key things. You have to be a man in the middle. And uh, so I, I think in some cases I've seen where there's been a, at least a perception that a man in the middle is basically somebody that's monitoring what's going on. But this is a case, it sounded like you really have to be able to throw pack, actually manipulate the session. That's that right? What, that's my understanding, right. And so uh, by, by doing, what kinds of circumstances would you see this? So the circumstances that most people would probably see it in is if you're using a Wi-Fi access point somewhere in public uh, where mm -hmm. someone may control that access point or have a way of reading, directing the traffic to either a rogue access point or through other, some other server. Right. So that's, it's not really something you'd expect to see on the open internet. Uh, it's not impossible, mind you, because you know, we've seen large scale traffic redirections happen before you know, with, with larger, you know, presumed to be state actors or very well resourced mm -hmm. attackers. Uh, but I think most people, their worry would be in a smaller case where they're using you know, open Wi-Fi. Right, right. And so uh, I guess, so you conduct the attack, what do you get? You can basically break the privacy of the SSL tunnel if you're successful and you're able to do the man in the middle. And it's, I think it's pretty exhaustive. Just to get the one byte, you need to do 256 attempts against the server without the client knowing. And in those attempts, you might actually break the tunnel. So it takes a little bit of effort, but it's still, you know, it's a feasible attack if you're, I hate to use the word paranoid, but if you're paranoid, mm -hmm. you should be worried about this. Um, in general, you should patch um, and use a stronger encryption. And it, this kind of affects uh, both the client side and the, and the server side. So servers, um, they should switch to TLS version one and above, mm -hmm. and uh, clients should do the same. They right. should disable the ability to connect with SSL. And each customer, each site, has to determine if they're able to do that because potential, there is potential to break some legacy mm -hmm. applications and that, that really depends on what the application is. Right, and I think, uh, so if you have a browser, you know, if you're an end user or a client side, 
because you can go into the configuration and just say, you know, I'm not going to accept SSL v3. So I think in Internet Explorer, you go to the advanced settings and you have the opportunity to do that. And then a lot of the uh, service providers, major server providers have been making announcements to say that they're, you know, going down the path of blocking it. And uh, like I said, I guess there could be some folks, if I remember correctly, I, Internet Explorer version 6 and prior, for example, doesn't support TLS. So if you're on, I mean, that, is, that's about 8 or 12 years old now. Is that, am, I, am I remembering correctly? Unfortunately, you still have pockets of it, though, out there. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's still pockets of it out there, but there, there's a, a small set of users. And the, the issue, I think, to your point, Stan, is there may be some applications that aren't a browser, you know, necessarily a web server, that perhaps don't support the full repertoire of things that may have been around for a long time and so need to be very kind of kind of careful if you're operating an enterprise for example you might not want to block without assessing what the impact might be correct yeah, right. right absolutely all right cool now uh, just as, as a sort of a comparison to heartbleed which was considered pretty you know that, that was pretty serious i think a lot of people have been trying to grapple with this particular case how serious is it relatively speaking uh, there's something about Heartbleed that's fundamentally different here. Well, I think, <laughs> <laughs> that's true, Brian. Yes, I right. think. For, <laughs> I Go think ahead, for uh, I think for Heartbleed, one of the dangers was you could be very far away in a very remote part of the world, scanning the internet, sending a specially crafted packet, and basically getting private memory uh, unencrypted from the right. server without authentication or anything like that. So that was a real danger. And we, we heard reports at that time when Heartbleed was big that you know people's cookies were being taken and their passwords for various online services were being taken. With this uh, vulnerability, you really have to be in the middle of the specific target that you have in mind. Right. Um, and th even once you are, it's not a one packet and you're done scenario. It's you have to establish this very tightly controlled man in the middle where you really are intercepting and making sure you're only forwarding packets on. So there, there's a difference in the way you exploit it and the exploitability is not as straightforward uh, to get the payload, right, so to right. speak. Well, I think you know, perhaps a couple of others. One is that when you're going to get to that private memory, I think one of the concerns that existed with Heartbleed was that you could potentially get the private key for the server. And, and there's, there's, there's potential for key confusion here, but there are lots of keys involved. There's, a pri there's the private key on the service, server, which is really the private part of the certificate that you're provided when you set up the session, and then there's a private session key that's established. So in the case with uh, Poodle, we're concerned about the session but with Heartbleed, we were concerned about the server key that could potentially compromise all of the sessions subsequent or even prior that were encrypted using that key. And so there's a big difference in that, in that context. That is, if you have access to the traffic, you could passively basically decrypt all of it. And uh, so the consequence was you not only had to patch it, but a lot of server certificates had to be replaced. And, Consequently, the previous ones revoked in comparison to this one where it's effectively a configuration change as opposed to a patch. But another sort of comparison contrast, the new one potentially knocks out some of your older users, user, users of older software, you know, browsers, for example, or maybe an older application, whereas the Heartbleed one, once you did the patch, it really had no consequence whatsoever to the user. So lots of sort of uh, things to trade off in these, between these two. But I think the consensus is Heartbleed was really bad. This one, there, aren't, there isn't really strong evidence of active ex exploits, perhaps even uh, difficult to see if there are active ex ex exploits in this particular case. So that's a There's subtlety. There's definitely that some scanning going on where people are trying mm -hmm. to determine what servers are out there that, are, that have SSL v3 enabled. But that's always going on. I know there's a lot of research projects out there that mm -hmm. just scan the internet and try to figure out what are all the certificates. And I've read I've right. read a lot of research papers about it. So it's just par for the course. Uh, but certainly people are looking for it. All right. So Stan, you were telling us earlier about 
man in the middle and how, you know, who would do this? <laughs> Uh, so, so it turns out some people actually do men in the middle, and in some cases they are potentially large right. state actors. So the latest news uh, from a site called greatfire.org, which monitors uh, censorship in China, mm -hmm. they're reporting that users of Apple's iCloud and of Microsoft's Live.com Hotmail service are being men in the middle. They're finding that when they go to the site, a, a fake certificate is being presented to them, mm. Uh, self-signed, which is usually a very good tip-off that something is the matter, yeah, for at least for a large right. site like that. Mm -hmm. And the traffic itself is ending up at, apparently, the IP address that's intended, except it's being routed through several different servers somewhere in China. Mm. So it seems that someone has an interest in uh, unmasking or collecting credentials for users of iCloud and Live.com. Mm -hmm. Now, why they want to do that is not sure. There's a lot of speculation around this. The new iPhone 6 came out in China this past week, and they think they may coincide with that. Um, there's always the possibility of some sort of political reasons for trying to get access to these users. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting that it's a, it's a large-scale thing, and it only seems to be occurring within China. Right. Now, were, were there indications of uh, that it was different for different organizations or different people, or do they think it was just, uh, just a, sort of a massive... The common theme seems to be the location itself. I don't mm -hmm. think that they've actually tried to... No, there's, no one has reported, I'm, you know, I'm in China and this is working fine. Mm -hmm. All the reports seems to be, I'm in China and this is a problem. Okay. Now, I guess it's kind of curious, and perhaps we don't know the answer here, but you know, how, how many people are really, I guess this was a group that monitors censorship activities, right. but I guess uh, you know, how often are people, I know as analysts we tend to check of routes and see where things are routing to, but I guess it is a normal course of business. Do you know how this was discovered? Uh, I'm not sure how it was discovered. I know that there's a pretty good set of evidence out there collected by both Great Fire and mm -hmm. by a couple of users on Twitter who are posting, you know, screenshots and the links to their own packet captures or trace routes, showing that the the, the, tr the patterns of of, of interception. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to be happening probably somewhere within BGP. I mean, we've seen attacks where someone gets redirected, they end up at the wrong server entirely, and it's obvious right. by the IP address. You know, maybe someone's tampering with DNS. It usually results in a denial of service attack of some sort. Right? It's possible, yeah. <laughs> so, but this this seems to be you know someone has access to routing, so someone mm -hmm. with some sort of higher access than the normal attacker. All right. Okay. Well, it's certainly something to keep in mind. I guess you know. At, I guess as we progress through. Uh, you know, the program and you know, our security analysis activities, some things where we thought there used to be sort of theoretical possibilities and but never really had witnessed those kinds of cases. I think we're seeing more and more cases where higher levels of sophistication are being brought to the, uh, you know, brought to the attacks. And so things that were theoretical years ago finally become something we really need to be paying more attention to. My assumption these days is generally if someone's thought of it, Someone else has tried it already. They're at least trying it. Or no, the question trying. is, are they really leveraging it in a, in a malicious way that could be, you know, effective or, or usable in, a, in nefarious purposes? So, and with a certificate like that, with a self-signed certificate, it makes me think a little bit more malice there that you could see the files and things like that. But I wonder. I've always been curious. So, if you go to a browser, it usually tells you that hey, you got a self-signed certificate. I wonder how it works under the the devices, let's say you log in from your phone. You know, that's interesting. Um, I believe it was the Great Fire article itself wrote that most modern browsers will detect this and alert you immediately. Um, except they called out the, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but Kihu or Chihu 360 secure browser apparently does not, which raises a lot of questions. Um, about how secure the secure browser is. Precisely. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah. I agree. Most modern browsers should be able to protect against this. Now, it's the it's the the applications that happen to use SSL but don't perform that sort of certificate validation, which they really have to be doing in this day and age. Mm -hmm. Those are the those are the users who are going to fall victim to these sorts of attacks. Yeah. I, I guess I I think you actually kind of stumbled on a, a, a tangential, but I think a key point just because something says it's secure. <laughs> doesn't mean it has anything to do with security. It just means that they are marketing it for something. So I could take a black paint. Sharpie and write on my mug, secure. <laughs> you absolutely <can. laughs> could do that. <laughs> it wouldn't show up on this mug, however. No, it's a nice mug, too. I would <laughs> do that. 
Okay, so uh, Stan, you've been looking into some other types of malware recently. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on in this sandworm world? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Jim talked last week about the a CVE uh, that affected OLA objects uh, in, I guess, PowerPoint, and mm -hmm. there had been some uh, I, PowerPoint exploited things observed in the wild uh, that targeted uh, people using the black energy malware mm -hmm. exploit kit, let's say. And it was CVE 2014, uh, 4114. And there's actually been a couple of security researchers who are posting that those exploits that were originally reported are being modified by other threat actors. And it's mm -hmm. not something unusual, you know, we see that all the time. But it is interesting to note that the exploit is being modified by other groups is being distributed, and one of the security researchers, his Twitter handle is uh, Physical Drive Zero. He's actually posting on his Twitter feed uh, some of the new samples that come in. He tags them with the CVE number, and uh, he extracts the C2 information and posts that up there for people, uh, so they they're kind of aware mm -hmm. of where the malicious threat actors are operating. One interesting thing about it as well is that the original PowerPoints were. Uh, targeting, uh, I guess, Russian-speaking or Ukrainian-speaking individuals, and there is certainly a couple of things like that on the internet that you can download. Uh, th this latest batch appears to be Ebola-related, so the PowerPoint inside of the exploit it has to do with, uh, I guess, guidance on Ebola or something like that, mm -hmm. and is even named Ebola.ppt, uh, actually in a foreign language. So there is, you know, this thing is being adapted. We always know that this is happening. It's mm -hmm. just there's some evidence and security researchers are really on top of it. All right, well, good. You know, yet I think you, again, another sort of tangential topic. We usually try to bring, you know, highlight warnings to people about, you know, phishing attacks that might occur, trying to use, you know, themes in the media, particularly ones that people might be fearful of. And it's like, oh no, something about Ebola, I've got to protect myself and click and, you know, and uh, we had Murray on the program a few weeks ago, and uh, you know I think one of the lessons that he tries to teach us is to think before you click, and uh, so try to get uh, you know control that emotional response in cases like this. So uh, keep a watch out for Ebola type um, you know targeting activity that might be taking place. I don't, Andy. It sounded like you might have had something to <laughs> add here. No, I, that, that's exactly exactly the point. Is that you know these right. things tend to tend to uh, go with what's happening in the media. So um, those things tend to be the things that make people, you know, it's like, oh, wow, I, I just saw that on TV yesterday. Mm -hmm. It must be something that I need to click on. So, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So, Stan, you've been, you do a lot of analysis in the, you know, more advanced attacks, the persistent ones. And so have you seen, you know, sort of some trends toward, um, I, I guess what I'm thinking is along the lines of blending more, using more techniques that might be known from other places to, you know, perhaps even hide what's advanced versus not. <laughs> well, that's always the risk, especially for advanced threats. They can pretend to be anything or any type of mm -hmm. exploit. This, I think in this case, uh, it's a great example of, you know, when one APT group has something and it becomes publicly known, to me, the exploit became known through you know, some security collaboration that we do with other, with, with other security researchers. Mm -hmm. uh, but it made me think, you know, so are the bad guys. They're collaborating. Right. Even, the, even when it seems like it's non-related groups, um, mm -hmm. they, they have access to the same exploits, just as we as security researchers do. And they're able to modify the exploits and, and then repurpose them for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I know with some of our analysis, I know Matt did some research into this as well. You know, we've seen some of the advanced uh, persistent threat actors use this exploit as well. Right, right. Now, just out of curiosity, is that specific to PowerPoint or is that something that can be... I think the initial exploit was using PowerPoint, but it, it was my impression that that could be used in other types of uh, document formats. It might be that it could be any document, but I'm not familiar with it enough. I know that the exploits we've seen uh, and that we've analyzed mm -hmm. have been PowerPoint. Uh, but it is, uh, the, the real vulnerability is including these uh, OLE objects mm -hmm. that actually pull their content from a share. Okay. So from an external share. And because of how 
uh, this process is handled, that I can actually allow you to download malware, so the first stage of malware and execute it. Uh, so that's, I guess, the exploitability of this vector. Okay. All right, very good, thanks. Uh, Matt, let's go back to you here, and now uh, perhaps shift gears a little bit. Well, not <laughs> we're not getting away from the advanced activity here. In fact, this is getting, I think, perhaps a good example of how sophisticated it can really get. Yes, it's true. Um, so there was a report that came out recently from Invincia. It has the charming name Operation Death Click. Uh, as what's happening here is that Invincia was observing that particular threat actors were using malicious advertising as an attack vector, which was not, nothing we haven't seen before. Right. I mean, malvertising has been cropping up on major websites for a while now for the past mm -hmm. few years. What's different here is that they're using something called real-time bidding in order to inject their ads. Now, real-time bidding is a process that certain ad uh, servers provide that you can pay for you know, your ad views mm -hmm. um, very specifically. You can say, I'd like to have, I want the, the ads to be viewed by a specific demographic in a specific geolocation area or even to the specific customers of a company based on the IP range or perhaps mm -hmm. by their interests. Interests is something we've seen for a while, but these, right. the other ones are very much like they know exactly who they want to advertise to. Yeah, so this sounds like it's uh, kind of a, a product accommodating the big data analysis activities. That is, if you have a product that you're selling and you know your demographics really well, you want to be able to pay for advertising toward, you know, it's more valuable to be paying for advertising toward you know, individuals perhaps mm -hmm. that are most likely to buy your products, right? Sure, exactly. So this has, you know, real-time bidding by itself is not a malicious activity. No. It has perfectly normal and understandable mm -hmm. motivations behind it. Saves us from the spam of all those other... <laughs> it makes my ads more targeted to me, which <laughs> right. makes me uh, a little bit nervous. But, <laughs> but the interesting he thing here is that, you know, it only costs maybe somewhere within the range, I think it was like 49 to 79 cents per impression or view. Mm -hmm. um, and these, these sorts of bids occur very, very quickly. They're, they're an automated process by which, you know, someone reaches out to a website to retrieve an ad. That ad server calls back and says, here's what we know about this user mm -hmm. who wants this. And then the rest of them will make a, you know, they'll, they'll bid, it'll be arranged, and that whatever ad wins gets sent out. Mm. Now, if someone has, you know, a small amount of money, they'd like to do a targeted ad injection that with malicious content, what they can do is, and this is what's in the article, they'll set up a company that sells, you know, that is, you know, providing ads. Mm -hmm. They'll run it legitimately for a long time, build up a reputation, and then exactly when they need it, and they've identified the user they want to attack, they will switch out their content for a malicious ad. And then, once the ad's been, you know, once the paywall has been uh, exploded, I guess, or a, a better word, they throw away the infrastructure. It's gone, it's used once. No which, is, which is a little bit scary because, you know, yeah. the best systems we have today are things that are based around reputation where you've got, mm -hmm. you know, you know that this server has been, using, been used several times before. This domain's been used several times. This exact code has been used several times. Right. So it's, it's the, the, the combination of the very disposable mm -hmm. and the, the split-second decision that makes this kind of scary. Now, I'll be fair. This is a report from Invincia, and they do have a product that solves this, uh, that works in this space. It's not intended to focus on, it can solve so, this kind of problem, right? Exactly. So, you know, it, it may be that they, they're, they have an interest in, in hyping mm -hmm. it up a little bit to make it seem like theirs is the product to solve this very important question. I'm not sure how, how much it's been seen outside of their own right. research. So I'm going to take it with a grain of salt, mm -hmm. but everything that they've said in the article is factually correct and possible. Right. So, you know, it's something to worry about. I'm just not so sure how much yet. Yeah, it really does sound like something out of the next James Bond movie, right? It's, it's, right. it's fairly advanced, yeah. <laughs> Where, they, you know, they create all these fancy things. He always has the right missile and the right, right. car yeah. facing the right direction under the circumstances. And so that, that's what this kind of feels like, is the, uh, the right weapon right at the right time and not by accident. <laughs> it's, it's amazing how how much that targeted stuff is actually used today. I mean, it's right. just so, I mean, you know, it, it goes so far as uh, your, your Pandora app on my phone. Mm -hmm. You know, as you drive around, that app knows where you are and it's literally sending you, you know, targeted a uh, advertisements mm -hmm. based on, you know, what it knows about you. So if you're driving through, you know, right. New York City and you happen to be down in, in the, Right. In the village, they may advertise a specific restaurant right, to you exactly. because it knows where you are. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, I guess one of the things that you can hope for is that when you experience an attack, it's not if, it's when you experience an right. attack, you at least get the opportunity to experience one that's more sophisticated 
rather than be victimized by something rather mundane. And so, you know, that's the that's what the uh, that's the opportunity to aspire. That is to to force them to use one of the most sophisticated attacks against you. And at least you have the opportunity to learn something from one of those right. cases. Yeah. So. I thought you were going to say more personalized attack. <laughs> well, it's a, that's one of the uh, attributes of the more sophisticated, sophisticated attacks. I can't even say the word properly. <laughs> so, Okay, so Manny, let's go to you here. And uh, I guess uh, I'm not sure if this is as sophisticated as it is perhaps brute force, but it's certainly one that uh, we want to be paying attention to. I think it really brings it sort of a new angle to the security topic. Yeah, so uh, so this is basically a, a, an article um, that talks about, uh, I guess, some research they had done in, uh, I guess it was in Malaysia, mm -hmm. um, and it talks about this uptick in malicious software that can basically infect ATMs. Mm -hmm. So it's a you know it's a whole it's a different angle on this thing, but you know obviously we know that ATMs are running. Windows XP embedded, mm -hmm. you know, so they're obviously susceptible to this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, what makes it interesting is is that the the the, the research that they did um, shows that they um, they have eight they from eighteen ATMs they were able to extract a million dollars wow. from from these uh, from these ATMs. Yeah, I'm surprised they have a million dollars in 18 ATMs, but I guess you, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, and the the article specifically talks about uh, ATMs that are manufactured by NCR, mm -hmm. although it, it's not. You know, if you look at it, they, they were they were talking specifically in this article about NCR, but it really is for any ATMs mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. um, they were. Uh, they were talking to somebody, and I can't remember who it was within NCR. I think it was some media relations person, and uh, and they were talking about the ATMs and the the software that they were running on them. So mm -hmm. they're obviously we're, you know, we know that they're running XP, but these particular ATMs are are what they were saying was these are ATMs that are about seven years old. Mm -hmm. They have new ones out today, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, these old ones represent about 50% of what is out there from NCR. Right. So it's it's they're still prevalent out in, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and what they talk about is they talk about these these st standalone or unintended un unattended mm -hmm. uh, ATMs, which basically means they're not as part of a bank, they're not, right. you know, vaulted into so you can't get into sort of, you know, not as well protected you know, physically. You four, four sides right. of them. Um, and so what you can basically do with these things, and I guess what's happening is that they can actually pry into the top of these things. Mm -hmm. They know where to drill holes into to get into the ports right. that they need to get into, the, either the CD drive or the USB uh, right. um, port. You only need a hole this big to put a USB drive in there, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You so, know where the hole is. Um, put the hole. So, you know, and the, and the article goes into saying that, that it's not so much that the problem is is that these, these ATMs are running XP. It, it's not really the base OS yeah. that's a problem here. It's the, it's the ability to access these ports. Because mm -hmm. you can get around the OS once you've got access to, you know, the actual ports on these things. So it, it goes into, and there's a couple of, with the, with the article, there's a couple of charts that were showing, you know, sort of the uptick in this type of attack on the ATMs as opposed to the previous attacks, which was, and not to say that this doesn't happen anymore, but the, the ATM skimming, mm -hmm. which is basically, you know, being able to insert some device onto it to extract right. the card data, mm -hmm. not, the, not the money you know, m making the machine actually spit right. out money, yeah, but uh, the but the actual getting yeah. the card data. So um, it, it goes on to, to talk about the two types of malware or the two types of attacks on the ATMs. One of them they call the uh, the black box, which is basically some sort of external device that they literally plug into into mm -hmm. the ATM, and they're able to basically click a button and have the machine spit out money. And then the other one is basically a malware, um, and there's a really cool like two minute video um, that shows this actually being done, mm -hmm. um, where they have a laptop installed, they install the malware. There's actually, the malware that they install, there's two of them. There's uh, the, the pad pin and the 
T Y Upkin. Tupkin, yeah. Tupkin, yeah. Tupkin. right? Yeah. Um, and uh, and so the the pad pin is basically just this executable that mm -hmm. gets installed on the on the on the base OS anywhere on it. And then there's like two registry keys that get modified um, that basically allow it to get started every time the ATM mm -hmm. is reset. Right. And then basically the the um, the video that was there shows them basically going in, installing the malware on the on the ATM, and then they have a secret pin that they're able to enter. And mm -hmm. so what they're able to do is they can walk up to this ATM at a later date. They have like this, an eight-digit pin that they just punch into the pad because they mm -hmm. they've now got access to the pad on the ATM. Mm -hmm. They're able to enter in this eight-digit pin, and then hit a command to just extract money from the. Right. Right. So. So I guess the way I see this, and, and, and in fact, I think in the article there was a comment, and Matt, you pointed it out to me, the, uh, there was a reference to the 10 immutable laws of, uh, of security, and one of them is that once you give access, someone access to your machine, it's their machine, it's not yours any longer. Right. I, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but the, uh, I mean, this is one of these cases where if you want to protect the ATM, the physical security has to be as good as your adversary. That is, uh, if you're going to have a million dollars, and 18 ATMs, then it's probably worth a million dollars to Didn't protect right. those those devices from from attack. Right. And uh, otherwise, you're you know you have the at least the risk of of losing money. And so ultimately, what it comes down to, and I think the other point you you made about older versus newer devices, that is perhaps the newer devices have better tamper protection measures based on what they've right. been learning. Yeah and uh, maybe it's worth a million dollars to replace the older ones. That ultimately becomes a business decision, and I think it's an important aspect of this, uh, this entire security you know, issue is that to try to quantify the risk and, and, and the, uh, the trade-offs in terms of making business decisions about applying security. And this is a case where they have at least the opportunity to equate, you know, we're losing, literally losing this amount of money. There, that's not always the case, you know. If, if you lose some documents in an enterprise because somebody stole them or somebody's uh, personal information has been stolen, it's a little harder to quantify that in terms of uh, the financial loss and to be able to say, okay, it's worth this amount of investment to make the uh, to make up the difference. And but so I think this is a really good illustration in the sense that it it is something that you can translate into a business case and make a good argument for investing. And right. improvements, and obviously, the the business case hasn't pushed it enough yet mm -hmm. to make it sort of warm, you know. Oh, that for may the, put it a bit over the over the edge, right? And part of the reason, perhaps, that study had been done to try to get try a to right, yeah to try to get that the business case that number be. past fifty percent right. of the businesses actually replacing them. So I, I think the other side of this, and perhaps a you know a value proposition associated with this program, is getting more insight into, into the experiences or events that are taking place in other parts of ind other industries even gives a lot of you know basically knowledge that you can use to help build these cases that is you know if you've seen this kind of case event over here this level of sophistication you can expect it to occur in other places as well for equivalent or similar type value you know systems events and and so it helps to be able to build those business cases, I think there's a lot more information available now than there had been even just a few years ago. And it's very important that, uh, I think I call that uh, contextual threat intelligence, that is to understand the threats you're working against uh, or protecting from are important to be able to understand how you should be investing in protecting your own organization. Okay, so Stan, let's go back over to you here. and. Um, we were just talking about stealing information <laughs> in addition to money. So uh, maybe you can tell us about one of the, uh, I guess, another little trick that's being done. Yeah. Well, uh, there's a, a trend micro blog that they put out today. It talks about a malware sample. I think they identify it as T-SPY Drigo. And in this sample, the thing about it is when it steals your files, it uploads them into the cloud. So something like you know Google Drive. And it's not a new thing, you know, we've seen this before, uh, but I guess Trend Micro is making the distinction here that it is new to see Google Drive as mm -hmm. one of the malware samples. But it's been done before with other group providers like Dropbox. Of course, it makes it a little bit harder uh, for many businesses probably to block something like this because 
there's probably a lot of legitimate use of, mm -hmm. of Google Drive. A lot of companies probably use it as their solution for right. collaboration. So it makes it a little harder probably to detect and to block on mm -hmm. the network. So that's where you probably need something host-based to make sure you're detecting uh, these type of malware samples. Um, and the other interesting thing about this malware sample is that it actually uses the Go programming language, which is Google's programming language. It's not the first time Go has been found in malware, but it, it is interesting that these malware authors try to stay in the Google ecosystem. Hmm. <laughs> Well, they're, they're fans of product of the product, of, apparently. They must be. So it, it's interesting. It, the the um, I, I think a lot of cloud service providers, I, I'm say at least uh, ser storage service providers, I should say, uh, even email service providers have gotten fairly acclimated to scanning for malware in the content. That is. Sometimes that's fairly rel uh, relatively well recognizable, and you want to try to flag cases like that. But if it's a much, significantly more difficult to try to identify stolen material, <laughs> and, and that process, as you pointed out, that could be completely legitimate activity that's taking place. So I, I'm not even sure that you could even reliably look for evidence of automation in the process that is. Because um, right, there could be an app uh, that is there legitimate. There could be applications to the that are doing a backup yeah. service or something like that that uh, may be taking place. So, right. this one I think is very tricky for if you're relying on the cloud service provider to try to help you with this. So, what it tells me, and I think perhaps what you were alluding to as well when you said a host base, you really need something to help manage it from your perspective and uh, try to understand what is going on with your own data and. Yeah, there's other challenges there as well, like most of these uh, services are, as, uh, which is good, SSL encrypted in transit, things like mm -hmm. that. So you can't even know who is sending what where. You kind of really have to have a more intrusive uh, technology in right. place to monitor uh, what's coming out of your network. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's going to make it a, pro a problem for the service providers to do anything if when you've, when you've extracted the data, You've encrypted it before you drop it onto the into the cloud. Mm -hmm. What are you gonna do? I mean, how are you gonna? Yeah, uh, yeah I guess that's actually another obfuscation that you can do on top. Uh, right? I mean, they're all good ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, internet weather for the last week or so here, and uh, this is actually a graph that we looked at last week. I didn't even update it because this week looks very similar, but I wanted to put it into context with uh, some of the more current activity. So we're looking at about 240 days of activity, and this is basically the regular everyday scanning on DNS, and uh, we continue to see that single source in China that is doing this scanning activity, and it's uh, scanning on a number of other ports as well. We had listed before port 21, 22, 23, 25, 53, 80, 443, 33, 89, and 8080. So uh, basically it's looking for services that you would use for transferring information, getting remote access to systems, or performing proxy activities. So to get to uh, the more current activity, again, we're continuing to see this activity taking place. Uh, it hasn't really changed in terms of volume, but what we're gonna do is take this same graph here that's showing 30 days of data and we're gonna magnify the lower portion of it. So the scale here is actually around 70, actually the top of the scale is 75 megabits per second, and we're gonna take a closer look at it with the maximum scale at five megabits. Or actually, it's a, a forgive me. It's a, actually it's a flows per hour is what we're looking at. So five flow, five million flows per hour, and as you can see here, there's other activity that's kind of more persistent and taking place beneath. That's the part that I wanted to really share with you here is that uh, there is uh, basically a relatively new set of activity that started in about the second week of October and seems to be persisting underneath here. Now, perhaps what's happened is over time that scanning activity has basically probed pretty much all the address space for DNS, and now they're perhaps digging in a little bit deeper underneath. I'm speculating to some extent here, but it appears to be uh, at least a related actor group, if not uh, directly associated. 
Next item here is scan probes. It's showing up as scan probes on port zero UDP. We're showing 30 days of activity. And so, you know, we've seen activity like this before. We saw a bit of a spike of activity. Uh, actually, this was, it looks like it was on October 14th here. Over the last uh, couple of days, we've seen some, what I would say, more persistent activity that's been taking place. It, it actually does appear to be some probing activity. And Stan, you were helping to look into this a little bit. I mean, sometimes we tend to associate port zero UDP with uh, fragmented packets and perhaps reflection attack activity that might be fragmenting packets. You know, for example, large DNS responses, if they have uh, DNSSEC, they can fragment across several packets. And so a lot of the volume that we see associated with um, uh, zero UDP tends to be that. But uh, when we were doing some analysis here, it was a little bit different, right? Right. I think in this case, it might be some sort of a, a specialized test to see what would happen. Uh, right. Just because of the, t uh, the number and volume of, of packets and the number of bytes in each of the packets, it just seemed to be uh, indicative of uh, an actual attempt to see what would happen if you right. set all the ports to zero. And it did seem to elicit a lot of uh, ICMP responses indicating, you know, unreachable or timeout yeah. and that sort of thing. So uh, we did also see some other activity associated with this. It, it appeared that the same source that was doing this probing activity was also doing some probing activity on port 10,000 TCP. And we reported on this, I think it was last week? Was it last week? Perhaps yeah, the week maybe before. Maybe a few weeks ago, yeah. Uh, it might have been a couple of weeks ago. This was a case where we'd associated the port 10,000 TCP with uh, the Webmin application. And they did have a notice on their website. It was actually to protect against the shell shock vulnerability. But uh, I guess when you were looking at it a little more closely, it didn't look like perhaps it was directly exploitable or? Yeah, actually right on this graph when the spikes really started to happen, I mm -hmm. believe it was early, uh, uh, the Late end. September. Yeah, the end of September. That's when shell shock was the thing that everybody mm -hmm. was worried about. And right around that time, a patch was issued for the Webmin product. I think John Hogeboom had mentioned this, and uh, I, I did. I downloaded the versions of uh, Webmin and try to see what exactly did they change, mm -hmm. how did they patch, um, and they they did make some changes in the code to protect against shell shock. It didn't appear like it would necessarily be exploitable. They just you know made the code a little bit tighter, a right. little bit better at error checking. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, people were scanning. You could see here on the graph that they mm -hmm. were scanning quite a bit. And then the activity did drop off. And the interesting thing, I think, is that today we saw this source that was doing this scanning on port 10,000 and was also doing this strange uh, zero, zero UDP scanning right. as well. Um, it may indicate, and you know, this is just a conjecture, uh, maybe some sort of a compromised host that's doing mm -hmm. the scanning on somebody else's behalf. Yeah, it did seem to look that way, that this is probably a member of a botnet. And by the way, just taking a look at the scanning activity that we've seen on port 10,000, it does have that characteristic sign where you have a large increase in the amount of activity and then sort of tapering off or a decay associated with perhaps various hosts that are doing that activity, completing their task and sort of dropping off uh, the, in terms. And this is, by the way, looking at the number of sources that were scanning on that port. And so it's a very indicative botnet activity. And that's consistent with what we've seen over the last day or so here, where we, again, we saw the spike in activity and it's, you know, it's sustained a little bit longer, but we ha have, it. it's a little difficult to see on this graph, but that decaying sign that's taken place. So now whether the two are actually directly related to each other, each other is, uh, you know, somewhat speculation, but there's a pretty decent chance that that particular host is compromised and acting on behalf of uh, somebody else's uh, most likely not so legitimate intent. Uh, next item here is uh, scan probes on port 22345. This is again one that I think we reported last week. We uh, were able to associate this port with uh, the Adobe Digital Enterprise Platform document services. And uh, it appears to be some sort of a TCP locator service. Is that right? Yeah. So we're basically to be able to find other servers. Uh, if I understand correctly. This probing activity seems to uh, be continuing to take place, so it's something you want to be paying attention to. The source that's doing this probing, again, it's single source in China, it's also probing on port 22 TCP, which, as we well know, is associated with SSH, often associated with brute force password guessing attacks. In fact, 
it's one of the things I neglected to mention about the previous one, the port 10,000. That could easily be a password guessing attack, as well as uh, perhaps this one as well, or looking for opportunities to do, you know, uh, exploit weak passwords or default passwords. Next item here is the top 10 most probed ports. Not really any surprises here. There is one particular port that's moved up significantly that's 19. 100 UDP. There have been various reports out, including a, a number of reports for here in Threat Track about the use of port 1900 UDP as an attack vector and reflection attacks. We'll take a little closer look at that in a moment here. Top of the list is port 53 UDP, oftentimes associated with reflection attacks as well, followed by port 22 TCP, port 9064 TCP. That's uh, we determined to be uh, basically a proxy application that's being probed for, most likely to uh, anonymize activities, followed by port 23 TCP. So port 23 and port 22, both associated with brute force password guessing mostly. Port 445 TCP, followed by 8088 TCP and 8080 TCP, again, Anonymizing proxies, most likely the target there. Last but not least on this list, 1433 TCP, which is a Microsoft SQL database. Again, most likely password guessing. And um, you know, just as a reminder, if you're able to get administrative access to the database, you can most likely get administrative access to the machine as well. In fact, oftentimes, I guess it's a, it's been an overlooked fact that you can use you know, if you can execute with into the database, you can most likely do command execution on the platform and use that as a means to get privilege escalation as well. So databases aren't just an application, they're, <laughs> they're a way in. Uh, so take a, a little closer look at the scan probes on port 1900 UDP. Again, this is SSDP, that's Simple Service Discovery Protocol. I was on a call with uh, someone earlier in the week. I haven't studied this protocol, protocol in detail, but the description of uh, this expert was basically to uh, indicating that uh, this is not a well design protocol in general, and uh, so that's uh, one of the concerns here. Generally, it's being used in reflection type of attacks, and you can see the uh, sort of the spike of activity that got it onto the pie chart here. This is in terms of the number of flows associated with probing on that port. Again, uh, generally associated with denial of service attacks. In fact, this is taking a little bit of a closer look, not just in terms of the probing activity or the number of flows that are taking place. In this case, we're looking at the number of bytes over the last 60 days. And you can see over the, uh, basically through the course of September, we saw a pretty good amount of attack activity associated with this particular port. This is well up into the gigabit per second range. And we're seeing uh, basically a little bit of a spike of activity over the last couple of days that are showing up on this, uh, on this particular graph. So uh, port 1900 is uh, unfortunately alive and well. I think somebody had said, and uh, forgive me, I don't remember specifically who had done this study, but they had cited on the order of about 4 million devices that are on the internet that are responding to this pr protocol. And uh, as a practical matter, none of them really need to be. Uh, so it's just uh, poorly formulated devices, uh, what we commonly refer to as the Internet of Insecure Things that have been put out there and are not managed well. And uh, unfortunately, they aren't going to get patched anytime soon because uh, many of those devices just don't have good patching practices, nor owners that know that they need to be patched. And I, I, I see you nodding over here, Matt. <laughs> Matt's a, a, a strong proponent of this, well, uh, these issues be, as well. We should be worried when, uh, when whoever this was that you talked to says that the, that they, uh, the, the protocol was poorly written. That makes me nervous. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I think that was, uh, he was referring actually more in general to the universal plug and play and how it was intended to be. Um, you know, in, intended for good purposes to be able to right. facilitate, uh, but I, Always good and actually it's been probably a year or so since we talked about this topic on threat track, but uh, you know, one of the problems with universal plug and play is that basically you, you intend a firewall to be a means to protect against some of the problems that might occur on the network. And uh, unfortunately, universal plug and play basically puts any machine that's behind a firewall or, you know, at least a NAT you know, when we think of a firewall, home, home router is a firewall, uh, which is a little bit of a loose terminology, but uh, puts any machine behind that, on that local area network in control of what the firewall rules are. And so it's really a good practice to turn that capability off. And then if you want to do some gaming to be a little more specific about what ports get open, because otherwise 
And in fact, the machine could basically say, well, I want to open it up and allow any traffic in and, you know, whether it be command control or, or, or something else. So, but I digress. Uh, next item here is top 10 most sources doing the probing. Uh, no real surprises here. Um, we have talked about most of the items on this list many times. Port 445 at the top of the list, followed by port 23. 27015 is generally associated with the gaming activity port 80 TCP and port 8080 that's basically looking for web servers or proxies in some cases there. We have this port 5000 UDP. We've talked about it a couple of times. I'm basically on the uh, still a little bit on the fence on this one. Uh, we've investigated a little bit. It does look relatively innocuous, has not gotten worse, and has enough participation uh, in the type of participation that says, suggests it's either gaming or uh, as someone had suggested perhaps a uh, file sharing activity. The thing that's a little bit troubling is I normally when I see this type of activity, I expect to you know get some. Uh, uh, interaction around the community around this, and I haven't seen anything that really uh, supports what this application is at this point. Could very well be gaming. Last two here are associated with ICMP, most likely feedback from uh, scanning activity or uh, other types of probing. Sometimes uh, denial of service attacks can uh, create some uh, activity associated with ICMP as well. So that's our show for today. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at threattrack at list.att.com. And you can find ThreatTrack on the ATT Tech Channel. Just go to att.com slash threattrack. Uh, remember that's track with a Q instead of a CK at the end. Uh, you can find us on YouTube and on iTunes as well. And if you'd like to follow us on Twitter, our handle is at ATT Security. Uh, we're uh, basically a part of the ATT security family here now, and, um, and there are uh, interactions on Twitter associated with uh, our, our security activities. I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Manny. Thanks, Stan. Thanks, Matt. I'm Brian Rexrode. We'll be back next week with a new episode, and until then, keep your network safe.